when we hear that someone is at the end of life, we often hear in our local Asian culture, Pantang! Yeah, yeah, choy, 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 don't say. I am your host, Polin. Welcome to TAW Real Chats. Today, we are going to touch on a really raw topic of journeying with the loved one through the end of life. With me, we have Amelia Ismail, who lost a sister, Yok Ping, who's lost both her parents, and palliative doctor and founder of Carrie's Hospice, Dr. Ulu Chan, who managed both Amelia and Yok Ping's loved ones. This episode is brought to you by Ong and Maneksha, a law firm in Penang established since 1988. Now, Amelia, what would you have done differently in hindsight for your sister's end of life journey? Um, in hindsight, I would say that I would have dropped everything and be with her because she was in the hospital for a month and she was alone because uh, all of us just visited during the visiting hours. So yeah, in hindsight, I, th- I, I would have um, take, take, taken sabbatical from work and um, really focus on being with her and spending time with her. Yeah, that's, a, that's a tough one and we're always wiser, wiser in hindsight. Yeah. Um, Yok Ping, do you have any regrets? I think one of my greatest regret was uh, I've been very impatient with my parents. I have never, I never knew why did they behave in such a manner. I have always termed it as annoying. Then I realized that I actually didn't see beyond them. I was so fixated with their condition. Mm. I, I, I second what you say, you know, being impatient, we don't understand the condition and there's so many things that are happening, medical decisions to be made, um, logistical arrangements, etc. Dr. Wu, what would you say really matters during someone's end of life? I would say that most would want to treasure the time together. Having said that, um, I also have seen situations where family dynamics can be so complicated. I, I think knowing that if a patient and family know, have some idea that time is no longer open-ended, time is a bit limited, maybe that will help us uh, to have a, a, a little bit different mindset, uh, meaning that uh, we will uh, we make more conscious effort like what Amelia has said. <laughs> and uh, like what Yoping Ping has said, uh, we will also probably be more careful how we react. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and there are occasions uh, when uh, out of the tiredness of giving mm. care as a caregiver, yes. harsh yes. words can come out. Yes. And uh, when harsh words comes out and uh, when really time is limited, there's really no opportunity to make amends. That person then has to uh, struggle through uh, settling with the guilt, those kind of emotions in the grieving process. Oh, I feel feeling that it's going to be a really uh, difficult conversation we're going to be having um, today. Oh. <laughs> um, but coming back to, to this period at the end of one's life, right? And we're talking about, I mean, the three of us here, Paul, uh, myself, um, Amelia and Yok Ping, we journeyed with our loved ones during the end of life. Amelia, what did you find most difficult about that time in your journey with your sister? I would say coming to terms about uh, her dying because um, she was only 33. So, um, yeah, that was yeah still very young. So, at the point, we, was, we still had this hope that um, she would recover and, you know, continue on living. We didn't expect that she would die. So, the hope was still there. I, I don't think there are many people who, who, who find it so easy to just embrace yeah. Dr. Wu in all the times when you see families and patients in your role as a palliative doctor. I think, would it be fair to say that this is something that, you know, families struggle with to accept that it, it's time? Yeah, yeah. Especially when the patients are younger, when uh, parents have to watch uh, their children going ahead. And the question that often comes up is... Uh, I should be the one to go. Yeah. Not my child. Why? Friends listening in, um, could you drop us a comment in the comment box below? Tell us what is your greatest fear about death? There has always been a taboo or a stigma about death and the conversations about death in our Asian community. So drop us a comment. Tell us what is your greatest fear about death? Not just for yourself, but for your loved ones. I recalled when, when my late mother was, was ill, I knew she was uh, near the end of her life. But it's one thing to know, it's quite another to accept it, I think. And, and you, you, know, you, you sort of 
be in denial. And it's not easy, I think, at that point in time, even for the patient to accept that the end is near for them. Yoping, did you experience that with your parents? Did your parents find it hard or they were okay? They were they were accepting and that they embraced that the end of life was near? Not at the initial initial part. Um, I would say both of them had this self-denial phase. Mm. And then uh, as I had uh, strengthened myself, I only come to the position to, to tell them you have to accept uh, the condition, you have to accept what you cannot change. It wasn't easy. They, they just don't see the point why, why they are in that situation. Amelia, how, about, how was that like for your sister? Well, she was really upset because she couldn't walk. Due to her cancer, she was paralyzed, waist down. So one day, she confided in me that she was worried about her future because she couldn't walk. Mm. So what I did was um, I showed her a bunch of um, videos about this uh, motivational speaker who was born limbless mm. to sort of motivate her you know, to continue living. But um, in retrospect, I don't think I should have done that. I should have just listened to her and be with her at, at that time. So yeah, I think for me, supporting her emotionally was quite a challenge for me when um, she's going through her, her bout of um, emotional burden. I think that giving a motivational stories may not always be the best response. Huh? Uh, and it's more of uh, listening to them and exploring with them and I always uh, uh, remind myself and my team that when a person expresses something we will try to probe deeper meaning that take it the question as there's another question below that question so we open the door for them to talk more Uh, not being able to walk is a concern of course but beyond that there may be other concerns because you're not able to walk, therefore, I cannot earn a living. Because I cannot walk, therefore, da 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 da, da. And, and our role is uh, basically to help them explore that, see whether some of these uh, can be uh, attenuated somewhat, or uh, are there alternatives to that? I totally feel it when you say that. Um, I had a similar experience with my yeah. mother. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes in that moment, we stru- we, we're yeah. so quick to want to just fix the situation, <laughs> yes, you know? Yes. <laughs> fix it. <laughs> fix a situation that, that it's not fixable. Mm. And we lead, lead them on. Yo Ping, yeah. I think you're very brave. You had that conversation with your parents to accept the situation. I never did that. <laughs> and on <laughs> hindsight, I regret it so much. But I, I, I wasn't brave enough. So yeah. I, I have to, to commend you for that. And I, I hope that anyone else listening, you know, if you, you're listening in, take your things, uh, take your thing as your role model. Oh, yes. <laughs> and Billy is saying yes. <laughs> I agree. Because I went through it, as, I, I went through the difficult, the difficult way. So mm-hmm. I, I, I had no choice. I myself have to accept it. So I told them to accept it as well. So eventually they understood, they understood. And they accept your condition with an open heart. Mm. Emily, what does palliative care mean to you? I would say palliative care guides and supports um, family members and the patient as well mm. um, in their end-of-life journey. It helps to lessen unnecessary hospital visits so the patient can stay at home more. Mm. Palliative care is a very important support, but it often gets overlooked due to a stigma because people think like oh palliative care means I'm going to die already so but it's, it's, it's more than that the, the, the bigger, bigger picture is more than that um, at the point when they had the illness I was just so raw about the situation I mean the dates I the only thing I knew was my world is crumbling down <laughs> mm. I, I didn't know that at that there was help out there. I didn't know the existence of uh, palliative care services. So our friend actually uh, told us that Caris Hospice is here to help and their services is known as palliative care services, right. you know. And and uh, at that time, we were still raw about it. We didn't know. So we said, now nah, give it a try because we, we ourselves, we, we don't know where we are going. Uh, so Caris Hospice came in. And then they, they assess my parents and they make regular visits uh, weekly. And as time goes on, they will guide us and, and advise us what's the next course of action. Then there was once that my mom's 
leg muscles or something is weak mm-hmm. and uh, it's best that to bring in a physiotherapist uh, right. so a- as advice by Karis mm-hmm. Hospice. So I told my brother, this is the least we can do because their mobility has been restrained and mm. and by bringing in Karis Hospice, by bringing in a physiotherapist, we even got drivers for my parents wow. because both of us, me wow. and my brother, we are not in, we are not in Penang. We, we, we are, right. uh, I'm in KL, my brother is in Manila. So what, so I told my brother that this is the best that we could do. This is one way of showing, uh, of giving security and confidence to our parents while mm. they know that they're unwell. And mm. this is one way, knowing that we also have to leave home because we, 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 we need to work. Mm-hmm. So, so it is one way of giving them a sense of security and confidence. And above all, we are also telling our parents that we love them dearly. We have not neglected them for whatever situation they are in. We right. are here to stay. It's just that physically we are not at home. We are elsewhere because we have to work. So that that is how we portray the uh, the scenario to my parents. So in in your view. Palliative care, the palliative care that you understand it to be is to provide them the best that you can in that phase of their life, their end of life. As I understand it, um, palliative care, there are four pillars. I think I spoke to Dr. Wu um, before and she, she explained it to me that there's physical pain, there's emotional pain, mm-hmm. social pain, and spiritual pain. Now, spirit, when we say spiritual pain, it's not religiously aligned. It's, it's, we'll come to that as well. Dr. Wu, you can unpack that for us. Um, Dr. Wu, can you share... What are the common end of life physical challenges and, and how palliative care can help? So let's let's focus on the physical pain first. Can you unpack that for us? What might someone need? If your loved one is very ill, the mm-hmm. idea now, the aim now is to control the pain so that your loved one does not die in pain. Mm-hmm. That is our aim. Some patients, for example, uh, you may need radiotherapy to relieve the pain. Uh, so there is a role for this uh, radiotherapy, even uh, palliative chemotherapy, right? So these are the uh, various ways. And I want to pause them. you there. Yes. Sorry, when you say um, uh, palliative chemotherapy and radiotherapy, I think this could be quite foreign to some people. You know, we, what what do you mean by that? And do you, as a palliative doctor, do the radiotherapy or the chemo? Therapy. No, I don't. I work together with the oncologist. Uh, that's where the, the palliative care team has worked closely with the oncologist. Uh, we, we, we want a very, what we call a smooth uh, transition. So, transitioning so from curative uh, to palliative. Yes, right. right now. So, it is good to get the uh, palliative team earlier in, to work hand in hand with the uh, oncology team. The oncology team will certainly uh, give the treatment the chemotherapy and the immunotherapy, various kinds of therapies to prolong life. If there's uh, pain arising from a tumor pressing on the nerve, for example, causing pain. Mm -hmm. So with that chemotherapy or at times radiotherapy, Mm -hmm. that will help to relieve the pain, right? But Mm -hmm. you will need the palliative team in at the same time because uh, those will take a while to work. It may not work immediately. So you need to use medications to very quickly bring the pain uh, under control. Mm. This is part and parcel of the quality of life of the patient. Pain is just one example of a symptom. There are various other symptoms, but pain is the most frightening symptom uh, for most patients. So actually, physical pain is the one that's easiest to control because we have all the various uh, medications and various modalities for that. Also, that uh, the morphine is a very good medication that we use. But out in the community, there's still a fair bit of a morphine phobia. Mm. Uh, so uh, along the way, we will still have to work with our patients and family members uh, and uh, guide them along on the use of a morphine. Don't so that is physical pain. Why, why do people fear morphine? Because of the sedative effect. I see. But the body does adapt to that. Take a few days to adapt to that. The fear of side effects is the other one I talk about. Uh, uh, drowsy. Mm. A small percentage, a certain percentage will have some nausea. But usually these, uh, the body will adapt. Constipation. Yeah, these are some of the side effects. 
And then the others are less founded will be like, uh, they're afraid that if I use morphine, that it may not work when I really need it. Mm. Uh, so we have explained to them, it, 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 you know, it will, if it's the right, if the pain that, re- that responds to morphine, it will still work, but you need to titrate the doses. Uh, so other fears, other, if I may call it myths of morphine, is like, for example, you get addicted in you know, Malaysia, our drug addiction, drug uh, enforcement is very strong. For well, how many grams of morphine you get a death sentence. We, we kind of anticipate them and talk about that. So for example, if I am going to introduce a morphine soon, when we look at the patient's condition, we more or less know what kind of pain will respond to morphine. We will... Right anticipate that we will actually bring it up, talk about it first mm. to introduce a subject to the patient and the family and sense where they are in their phobia. Uh, and then we will work along with them so that when the time we need to use it, hopefully the ground is better prepared. Mm. And it is always important. Overriding factor mm. is so that your loved one die pain-free and to reassure them it is not injection that kills your loved one. Yeah, these are the main concerns uh, why people are phobic, mm. have phobia of using morphine. Right. But when we talk about physical challenges, pain is obviously a crucial one, a huge yes. one. Um, are there any other physical challenges that someone sees towards the end of life? Maybe, Emilia, you want to jump in in caring for your sister. Are there any physical challenges? Because she was unable to walk, so the physical challenge would be carrying her from the bed to the wheelchair and just basically transporting her around. Mm. So yeah, that's the physical challenge for, for us, the caregivers. And I would imagine if she is bedridden, then there will be the whole issue of bed sores and, and things like that, right? The, the question was, what's next, you know, after she was discharged? Because we were just not equipped with um, um, equipments and mm. we do not have the knowledge to care for her. So in that sense, I find that um, Caris Hospice really filled in the blanks for us. They provided us the hospital bed, um, ripple mattress, I think commode and wheelchair as well. And also taught us the necessary uh, knowledge to care for my sister effectively at home. And also pain management. That's very important. That, that's really interesting. So Dr. Wu, you're the founder and uh, uh, doc, head doctor at, at, at Caris Hospice. And Emilia just said that you know, Carrie's Hospice provided the bed, the mattress, the commode. I wanted to flag that, you know, your services are non-monetary because I think not, not many people know about that. And when you start hearing about Carrie's Hospice providing all these things, you might think, wow, so expensive, better don't call them. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, address that. No, we, we, don't charge, uh, we don't charge for equipment, but they will have to pay for their own lorry transport. Right? If they're poor families, then the office, my office will pick up the payments uh, to the lorry transporter as well. Uh. Yeah. So Carrie's Hospice um, helps with the physical challenges, you know, in terms of like um, providing the, the, and there are lots of physical needs. Uh, we talk about pain management, I mean, this broad or not, like, you know, patients are bedridden. Well, let, let's go to the emotional side of things. Can you elaborate a little bit more? What is the emotional and social pain that you often see, Dr. Yeah, I remember one, uh, one uh, elderly uh, man, on a few occasions, he didn't want to see us. He didn't want to see me, even if I was at the doorstep the uh, family member will say that he's feeling depressed. Uh, he doesn't want to see us. And uh, that's not uncommon. Uh, uh, but somehow, we thank God that along the, we managed to build some rapport with him. At the end of one visit, I asked him, Uncle, can I ask you one question? Uh, uh, is the physical pain uh, more or is your heart pain more? Often I use questions like this to just get at a deeper level with my patients. Right. Yeah, and he says, yeah, it's a heart pain. <laughs> mm. And that, that is true. Huh? And that is true. So uh, over the years of working with uh, patients, uh, my team has also probably learned to, to kind of uh, recognize what kind of patient profile uh, may have more of this emotional uh, pain. It's not that we are always correct now. Huh? Uh, but because this is a first impression, knowing a little bit about their family background and uh, how this person's mindset is like. So those of us who are very independent, very capable, mm-hmm. uh, but when the time comes, uh, an independent, capable person loses function. 
loses some function of this uh, and becomes a dependent on others to care for. Huge transition. Yes, huge transition. That's the difficult part. The question that comes also not too infrequ infrequently to us is, uh, I'd rather die, you know? Uh, right. And uh, why am I still alive? All right. Mm. Uh, and, I see uh, your pink nodding. Yeah. <laughs> and the longer this stretches, this spirit stretches, it can be tough, very tough, not just for the patient, but for the family as well. Right. Yeah. Yoping, how long was that process for you and your parents? Both my parents, my dad and my mom, easily uh, seven to eight years that we have been with Carrie's Hospice. So the Just now when I was long. nodding my head was yes. because Dr. Wu mentioned the example was very similar to my dad. Dr. Wu will know. <laughs> 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 Dr. Wu has spent so much time talking to him and to make mm. him comfortable and to come to accept, yeah, he's ill, he's not well. Yeah. How do you do that, Dr. U? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's a process. But having said that, we talked about hope earlier. In our medical team, of course, we can be very, very, uh, we are medical people. Uh, we can be very technical. Huh? We can just uh, tick our checkbox, okay? Uh, accepted diagnosis. But over the years, I've also uh, learned that it is a process. And just a hope is important. Uh, but at the same time, you are not blind uh, to making some preparations where we, we have a kind of balance. And, uh, and it's a process of moving along the journey. Uh, so one of the very, very uh, simple illustrations I use, especially with the more elderly patients, I tell them, Uncle Auntie, you're a very old motor car. You know, you're a very old motor car. You know, there are no spare parts for your motor car for this model. <laughs> And that's something that hopefully they can identify with. Uh, you make it that, so lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah, tell you some, some, some of the illustrations that my patients use when they talk about end of life care. And that's where I learned from them. Oh, you know, for example, for example, one, one, one patient was always asking, why am I not dying yet? Why am I not dying yet? And the daughter gave the answer. I thought it was very good. He said, Dad, your number hasn't been called yet. Hey, okay, I remember that. that last number not yet called. <laughs> you, know, you, you wait for your number to be called, you know. Mm. The question though is that uh, we can never exactly put our finger and know how long more. And that's the million dollar question that's often posed to me and my team. How long more do I have? Uh, mm. But still we need to give a more or less an estimate of uh, a time either in terms of days or weeks or months. What is the time frame for, for the patient and the family to, to make some preparations? I see. Would you say it's harder um, to have someone's end of life very, very short or someone that's a bit more protracted, like in your <laughs> parents' case, where it's like seven years? I mean, surely there are difficulties and different challenges with both. Yes, yes. It, it, I think there's something that even amongst my team, we talk about sometimes we sit down and say, hey, what would you prefer, huh? I think we, we are the one giving care, but at the same time, we also reflect sometimes, hey, what would you prefer? Uh, no? Which one's harder uh, emotionally? <laughs> I think it's a question that all of you will have to individually answer. I think everybody will have different choice. When it's very sudden. Easy on the patient. Uh, difficult for, uh, easier for the patient, <laughs> but difficult for the family. But I think that if the family has talked about it before, right. that will help to make it a little bit easier mm. uh, when that suddenly happens. Okay, when it's a, a very protracted one, it can be difficult for both. Right. Uh, but if the patient is already not so aware, mm -hmm. then the burden is on the family. Mm. If I hear you right, that you know we should normalize this conversation about deaths and end of life, so that yes. when the time comes, it's easier with our loved yes. ones, right? Yes. How about social pain? What is social pain? Yeah, social pain, we're all social beings. So uh, you are a somebody, you are either the father who is a breadwinner. So when a catastrophe like a critical illness happens and you're taken away from all this, you lose all this. Or even simple things like going out to socialize with your friends. 
Mm. And there are patients when disease, a critical illness happens like cancer, they don't want to go out and mix around for various reasons. Mm-hmm. Or they can't go out. Uh, mm. So that, that's what I mean by social pain. Amelia, do you, do you, did you experience your sister withdrawing herself as her diagnosis became clearer? Yeah, she didn't want to go out and meet people because I, I, I assume that she was embarrassed about her cancer. So she mm. just didn't, she just stayed at home and whenever we had to go for hospital visits, she would be in wheelchair. Mm. So she tried to uh, avoid eye contact with our neighbours because she didn't want the neighbours to know or to ask too much questions. So, so that's, that's quite hard, isn't it, you know, for emotional and social pain? How does palliative care help with uh, addressing these emotional and social pains? Letting the families hear them. Mm. Okay, let me explain that a little bit. That's why uh, one of the things that we do uh, quite often when we can is a family conference because there are times when the patient is overwhelmed or silenced by the family members. The they're not or they don't have the opportunity to express themselves. Actually, by the way, there's one question that my team would like to ask when uh, we go into a home. What is it about the dying that is most difficult for you to accept? And with that, I want to come to the point of eating. I'm not sure about the other cultures, but Chinese, uh, mm-hmm. Chinese, uh, we say, uh, yao si, uh. <laughs> can you, <laughs> can you un- uh, translate that? For yao our... si means starve to death. You don't do eat, that. you die. And uh, so we go at great pain to explain to the patient and family, at the dying phase, the patient does not need to eat. I, but aren't the, you, I, I'm going to ask a stupid question. Aren't yeah. you starving the person to yes. then? <laughs> That's a natural response. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a natural response. Huh? Uh, so uh, it is the, uh, but if the patient, so we will say go, according as, go accordingly with the patient. Mm as much as a patient can eat. And this is something regularly we bring up when we see an ill patient. We talk about it even before the patient cannot eat. We actually right. talk about it when the intake has dropped already and explain that there are various reasons why the patient cannot eat. And this is one thing that we want to talk about in family conference, mm. right? Because one of the usual thing is eating and appetite. Right. And usually there's a more of concern with the family than with the patients. But hang on, Dr. Wu, when you say eating, right? And as the patient progresses towards um, death, unfortunately, um, with eating, they couldn't eat solids. What about liquids? Oh, yes, you yes, go, yes. Will you move that or you say, what, oh, yes, are, you, are you suggesting as, that you cut off completely? You cannot no, eat no, rice no, no, no. As tolerated, as tolerated. As tolerated. So as a patient can tolerate. That means what we're advocating is don't force feed. Mm. So uh, soft diet and you go into liquids. Mm. Uh, and then you've got the Transition smaller amounts. Yes. And then maybe towards the last few days, it's basically sips of water. Mm. But that one is very difficult for family members to accept. Mm. Uh, so we will anticipate and explain to them. And when we have family conference, we talk about it openly. Mm. Uh, often we ask the patient, are you concerned that you have no appetite? And uh, quite often the patient may say no. But we ask the family, are you concerned that this your father and mother has no appetite and it's a big yes to them. Mm. You know, and we will always have to shift the focus back to the patients. What do you think concerns patients the most at the end of life from your many observations through the years? <laughs> there is a term called a good death. I mean, studies have been done on it. Uh, what constitutes a good death? And they come on multiple domains. You can have a Western study. I mean, the... An American study, you can uh, have an Eastern study, a Japanese study. What constitutes a good death? Right? They're basically uh, uh, common, common things uh, that talk about. Number one is good symptom control. Mm. That is still top. Mm. Physical pain. Mm. Uh, all the sim- various kinds of symptoms, good symptom control. Okay. Uh, bring it to a closure. Now, that is very subjective. Bring it to a closure? closure, meaning that if they are, they are really unsettled business, especially in relationships, difficult relationships, mm. uh, you might just want to close that. Mm. So one of the routine questions we ask our patients and the family 
uh, as we know the family, as we look at the family tree, you know, and uh, do you want to meet up with this person if the relationships are estranged? Mm. Having said that, we also know that some relationships cannot be repaired. Mm. So there really, there's, there's no need to pursue that to add further distress. Yeah. Uh, but there's uh, one thing that we will uh, look into as well. I see. Uh, and uh, when you talk about bringing closure, are there people that you want to uh, see or maybe just want to talk about, want to talk with? Mm. Especially this pandemic, they may not be able to come back. Mm. Uh, but with technology and so on, do you want to talk with them? So you do a video con- video call? Uh, then you encourage them, yes, to have a video call. Mm. Uh, and so this is uh, the closure. So a good death is really very subjective. Uh, some may say that a good death is when I just close my eye, I don't wake up. I've got patients who say that, you know. I wish that I close my eyes and I don't wake up. Mm. On the other extreme, I have also rare patients who dare not sleep mm. because they're afraid that when you sleep, then you cannot wake up. <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> one. I don't know how you do your job, Dr. Wu. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, 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 the whole range. Right, right. Uh, well, you, you know, with all these questions in my mind, it's going blank right now. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, you are listening. Please drop a comment below in our uh, comment section. Tell us what do you think a good death is. What is a good death for you? It's like so. So you talk about symptom control, medications for physical pain. So you're saying that for emotional and social pain, you actually talk to the patient a lot, provide therapy, almost counseling. Um. So we talk about emotional, social. Um. Doctor, how about spiritual? What is spiritual? And is it different yeah. for the different religions or is spiritual something else that, that is it, it refers referred to in the context of palliative care? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it doesn't refer to religion. It doesn't really refer, refer to religiosity. Uh, uh, spiritual has uh, more to do with finding meaning in your journey, finding meaning in your disease, uh, finding answers for that, and even uh, your preparation of uh, death. What does death mean to you? Amelia, why are you such a, a big advocate for palliative care? Because I've seen the best and the worst. Because I've seen my sister being taken care of by uh, Dr. Wu and his team and she d- died a peaceful death. In the meantime, I also saw my uncle who didn't engage palliative care. Mm-hmm. So um, he died rather in a painful manner um, without proper pain management by the family. So I actually saw um, him when, when I went over to visit, he was just lying on the uh, on a single bed and his son was trying to feed him um, mashed potatoes while he's still half lucid. So having witnessed that, I find that it's, it's quite horrific for me. Lah. So that's why I advocate for palliative care because I believe everybody deserves a dignified death. Yeah, and there's something that I like to follow up on what on what Emily said. I think dying with dignity. Uh, and uh, we, we we talk about good closure. But again, that's mm-hmm. very subjective. What is good closure? The one may not be good closure in another. Right. I have uh, family members, or I have patients who say, you just put me to sleep, just put me to sleep. So they may heavily put me to sleep. Uh, I don't open my eyes and see. Oh, that that is also one one scenario. Uh, but the other the other scenario is that I don't want, I want to be awake. A good closure is also subjective, but it's up to individual and family members uh, to determine. But I think good closure, no matter how subjective it is, is important. I would say more so for the family left behind than for the patient. Because often at the final hours or sometimes days, the patient is already uh, in dreamland. Uh, put it this yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, so less aware already. So therefore, the good closure is aiming at the family members so that they'll find it easier to move on in a grief journey, right? Now, I had a, I had a young, a fairly young mother. She breathed her last, and then uh, shortly after that, very shortly after that, the child came back from school. My nurse called the child, said, come, 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 talk to your mother. She can stay here, you. Medically speaking, uh, may not be quite right, lah, huh? yeah. but, but we needed, that, that we wanted the child to just connect with the mother. To have a good closure, as you say. Yeah, so that if she can remember that is that that, yeah. uh, that last memory of the mother. Mm. Uh, so memories are important. 
And I, that's something that we will tell our family members. Uh, so don't, don't quarrel. Uh, please don't quarrel about diet. Don't quarrel about all those things, you know. So don't force feed. Don't try all those, all your supplements, all your nutritious drinks. Uh, no need, no need, no need. Go along. Uh, because what is important is that you need to have, try to have, have some good memories. Yuping. In your story, in your journey, uh, Dr. Wu has shared a lot about what, how palliative care helps to give that good closure. H- has that translated, materialized for yourself? Because it was a long journey, seven years. Did, uh, did you get the good closure? Yes. Um, for my dad, um, when he has come to terms to comes to terms to his illness that yes he's ill he's stricken with the this with an illness known as cancer mm. well when he has come to acceptance with it it was a total uh, change world because wow. there, there weren't any more unnecessary fights within himself and with us we mm. don't need to hear him asking uh, or a daily asking his, his the question why has this got to happen to him? In fact, he went on to say, come, let's have family dinners. So because my dad himself came from a big, we came in from a fairly large family. Mm-hmm. So we had this nice dinner in this uh, restaurant in Penang. I can't remember the name. I think CRC or something. 40 to 50 of us, you know, with this. Because wow. my, my grandma has 10 sons. I see. So, so we we had this dinner, and uh, whoever whoever from near and far all came, you know. Mm-hmm. And the best part was he acknowledges. He said, "Oh, I'm 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 not well. I, I I have this, and if I can still eat and enjoy your presence, we're gonna do it tonight." And then after wow. the dinner, we had this family picture. Mm. Uh, this is huge family picture. Was yeah, that was a really a good closure. And then together with my mom, because at that time, the illness was still at the initial stage. So uh, they, they're still mobile. They, they, they could go for dinners and have chats with families. Mm-hmm. And then my brother sees the opportunity. Ever since then, uh, their birthdays, we, 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 we make a grand one and, 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 and organize a grand one and for the families and friends to come together. Yeah. So it was a good closure, not just for yourself as a caregiver, but also for your parents who were the patients. Yes, yes. So I still remember <clears throat> there was at a very late stage, mm-hmm. um, he, my, my dad actually said, I'm ready. Wow. We thought wow. it's, it, it's a miracle, you know, coming from the self-denial. Mm. And now he said, yeah, I'm ready. Because at that time, it was just exactly like what Dr. Wu said. He couldn't eat. He he couldn't drink. You know, then mm. uh, we were giving him some liquid ensure or something along that line. No, mm. he also he doesn't want. And doctor was said, just leave it, just leave. Because we we as family members, as usual, we wanted tube feeding. We 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 mm. wanted to force feed. You know. Then my dad said he 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 just said it. I'm ready. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah. So that was actually the last weekend. In fact, he asked me, go, you go back, go back to care and work. You know, so <clears throat> that was the last weekend. And then he passed on the, 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 the following week. Mm. Yeah. I want to clarify, no matter how good the closure is, it's still a tough journey for every one of us to go through. Uh, it's never easy and still an emotionally challenging one, I think. But then to have that good closure is, is as good as it gets. I mean, it could be much worse when, I mean, as Amelia shared, when, the, when there's so much pain involved and, and suffering as well. Um, and, 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 and Dr. Wood, that's where you, where you and your team come in, you know, in Penang, where you, you provide these community services. I understand the services of Carrier's Hospice is, is free. Yeah. Um, and you, you provide these services um, to support the communities in Penang. Um, to to help our loved ones transition into a peaceful passing. So, you is there a criteria for for whom can enjoy the services of Carrie's Hospice? Mm. In our referral form, to make it simple, uh, we have mentioned uh, stage three and stage four cancers. Uh, mm. uh, um, usually, at the time, uh, we are not talking about uh, curing the cancer. But there is a place for prolonging life, yes. There's still a place for prolonging life. 
and uh, certainly symptom control uh, and the emotional support and guiding the family along is important. One of the things that uh, we talk about at family conferences uh, is uh, to align care. As society, as families get more dispersed, uh, more so in this pandemic, uh, you have uh, family members, children strewn all over the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe just not just during this pandemic. Uh, that's what society is today, uh, yes. dispersed. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's often the family member who is left behind bears the greatest burden because uh, those who are away, uh, they don't see the whole picture, but they have lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Someone uh, want to say something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lots of suggestions on management, you see. Uh, so when we, uh, we will try to uh, get them together and then let's let's talk and let's align care what's possible, what is less possible, what is not advisable. Mm. You know, we, we don't make decisions for them, but we just uh, throw various options to them mm-hmm. and uh, helping them to look at various them. angles. Yes. Mm, and, and I sort of educate, I think for, for my family, you certainly educated us on, on what the options available at every stage was. Amelia, as we come to a close, uh, do you have any um Last words of advice to, to offer anyone who's listening in? Um, I would say try to, you know, um, take a step back and um, um, like what I, I wanted to do, take sabbatical from, from work and really focus on um, caring and being there with your loved one. Yeah. I think Dr. Wood, you mentioned to me before um, that when someone is dying, um, that connection is really important, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. So often we will uh, tell the family, uh, family members, uh, especially those who are, who are probably uh, can afford more. Uh, so uh, there will be this gadget, that gadget that they have purchased. Uh, mm-hmm. Because it's so easily available. The attention can be so caught up is just looking at if I may use this, all these readings or parameters. Mm. Uh, oh, what is the reading? Uh, what is the reading? Uh, uh, even, What's uh, the O2 level? Uh, uh, what is the O2 level? Uh, what is heart the rate uh, uh, What is the heart rate? Uh, <laughs> uh, what is the urine output? Uh, uh, we will tell them, put aside all these. Uh, you can give it to me. Uh, give me your gadgets to me. Uh, <laughs> put, put aside all these. Uh, the important thing now is just for you to sit with your loved one. Just hold your hand. Of course, you need to do the basic hygiene and so on. Uh, that must be done. Uh. Mm. And then put aside all these readings. Because these readings don't, make, don't, don't matter now. Yeah? And uh, what matters now is for you to just, just be there. Uh, but the basic things of cleanliness, all oh, that must be done, of course. I mean, yeah, I think, um, can I jump in? Yes. I think when it comes to cleaning up, um, cleaning the patient, as soon as Christine said, come, let me show you how to use the suppository, my eldest sister ran away. So I, I, I was left there, no choice. I have to go in and get, get, get down and dirty. <laughs> It, but it was horrible for me the first time. But after that, it became very normal. And I think my, my sister really enjoyed um, that bonding bonding mm-hmm. time with her. So like I was, um, I really took care of her, her, her of her hygiene. Mm-hmm. So the, that time we spent together, we would talk and I would try to, you know, not make her think so much by making jokes and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So uh, I, I was very happy that I bonded with her during her end of life. And it brings back uh, memories that you cherish. I'm sure some of the yeah. conversations that you had in those times. <laughs> I think nothing prepares you for journeying through end of life with somebody until you've gone through it and, and it takes yeah. one person to another <laughs> and you know exactly what they've gone through. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's all the time we have for today, folks. Um, I hope you've gained some real insight into this inevitable part of life. If you like this episode, you found it helpful, give us the thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. We would love to see you at our next Real Chats. Bye for now.